We're not crazy. The system is. Tune in to Madness Radio, Voices and Visions from Outside Mental Health, Wednesdays, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Time, on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3, Valley Free Radio. Produced by Freedom Center and the Icarus Project. Streaming live, podcasting, and archived at madnessradio.net. Thanks for tuning in to Madness Radio. This is your host, uh, Will Hall. And today we have um, Charles Barber. Charles is author of the um, the new um, nonfiction book that just come out called Comfortably Numb, How Psychiatry is Medicating a Nation. And this is actually getting a, a huge um, reception. It's a very popular um, book. It's making a big splash in the um, in the media, and so we are very honored to have um, Charles Barber on the show today. Uh, Charles Barber was educated at Harvard and Columbia and worked for 10 years in New York City shelters for the homeless mentally ill. The title essay in his first book, Songs from the Black Chair, won a 2006 Pushcart Prize. Um, his work has appeared in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and Scientific American Mind, among other publications, and on NPR. He is a senior administrator at The Connection, an innovative social services agency, and a lecturer in psychiatry at Yale University School of Medicine. He lives in Connecticut with his family. Um, so welcome to Madness Radio, Charles Barber. Uh, thanks, Will, and it's, um, it, I appreciate being on uh, Madness Radio. This is a... Uh, probably a much more interesting interview than a lot of the ones I've had. Yeah, I was, we were talking before, a lot of the interviews you've had have probably been like five, ten minutes, so we'll have a, a good a good hour to spend with you today. And I have to say, it's it's interesting, um, because actually I, I, I was at, I know that you're a, um, a uh, uh, lecturer in psychiatry at Yale University. Actually, I was, little known fact about Will Hall of Madness Radio is I spent a summer at Yale in 1982. I was, I was an undergraduate. It was a very very unpleasant um, time in some ways, but last night I had a, a dream about it where I saw this sort of big imposing, imposing black stone buildings of the kind of the, the Oxford College model that Yale has um, over in uh, New Haven. So it's it's interesting to have you on the on the show today. So welcome, welcome to Madness Radio. And your your book is getting a, a lot of uh, a lot of attention, a real big reception, huh? Yeah, it, it it came out pretty much uh, exactly a, a month ago, and I've had an interview or two a day. Like today, today I've had another interview in another hour or two, um, including I was on the early show on CBS and C-SPAN, and uh, there should be a fresh air interview on NPR coming out, and you know, to many radio stations, and really uh, a lot of interest and a little bit of controversy. Um, and I, I guess I've touched a, a nerve. Um, you know, I think that psychiatric drugs are something that affects most people one way or the other. Either they're taking them or someone in their family. And, you know, what I write about a lot in the book is how they've entered the culture. So um, the, the, as really sort of household items, um, particularly the antidepressants um, and, and also the kind of culture of diagnosis, um, the, we've seen this huge expansion of um, psychiatric diagnosis over the last 50 years. Uh, and so I think it's something that a lot of people relate to or they have opinions on. Um, and so there's just been uh, a, a ton of discussion. I, I wrote a an op-ed piece in the Washington Post uh, about three weeks ago um, that talks about some of the, the recovery movement of people with se severe mental illness getting better, which I'd like to talk about those issues later. Um, but I've, I've gotten 350 emails um, from that piece so uh, which i've i've answered 300 of them so far so i'm i'm getting there well it's great it really does feel like there's some cultural changes happening um mm -hmm. which uh, your book is kind of part of part of that uh, zeitgeist and part of that that change well tell us about the book what's kind of the um um the message and the research that you present and what's what's sort of the um perspective that you take yeah, um, the first half is called Neurons Incorporated, and it's about um, the just some in the beginning some facts about uh, the use of the drugs, the profits from the drugs, how the drugs were introduced, and again, I'm mainly talking about the antidepressants. You know, there have been studies that 11% uh, of American women are taking them. 
Um, they're, they're the most prescribed uh, class of drugs in, in the country. Um, there, in 2006, there were 227 million antidepressant prescriptions written in the United States. And the first half of the book explains that context um, in, a, in, a, in a bunch of different ways. Uh, one, the, the rise of biological psychiatry, which is really a fairly recent um, phenomenon. It was only in the 1950s or 60s that the first purely biological of ex explanation of mental illness appeared in a, in a medical journal. Um, and the prevailing theories of the brain, you know, going back 50, 60 years ago were electrical rather than biochemical, you know. And not that mental illness is not largely a biological phenomenon, but I'm, I'm skeptical of the the rapidity and the full embrace of just seeing it as a biological phenomenon. Um, so I talk about the history of biological psychiatry. I talk about the history of, of the drugs. Uh, I talk about the expansion of, of diagnosis, um, where the first DSM, which is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, that came out in the early 1950s, had 50 diagnoses. Um, and uh, it, the latest version has more than 300. Um, and so psychiatry has sort of moved from dealing with really severe conditions uh, to, you know, arguably far lesser conditions and even life problems. Um, and then I write about the marketing of the drugs, um, particularly the TV uh, commercials, um, which started happening in the 1990s and how that sort of brought the antidepressants in particular sort of into, the, how, into our households and into our consciousness. Uh, and then the second half of the book is, it, it, I'm happy to say, is the, the book is not just sort of beating things up, but it's also um, offering, I hope, practical and interesting alternatives. So the second half of the book is called A Series of Alternative Approaches. And at a clinical level, I, I write about cognitive therapy, which um, to my mind has very good outcomes for milder depression. I write about the history of cognitive therapy. And then I write about the lessons of um, the recovery movement, um, some new uh, psychological research about the complexity with which how people change and how to work with people to help them change. And then I write more philosophically that depression in its lesser forms or sad emotions aren't necessarily a bad thing, you know, and that we shouldn't be so quick to medicate them. So essentially it's, there's two parts. One is sort of what happened that created this huge uh, overuse of medications. And then the second half is, you know, some different ways of looking at things for people's consideration. You mentioned uh, the biological issue, and that's something we talk quite a bit about um, on Madness Radio. We might we might have a different point of view. I think we do probably have a different point of view on that. So maybe we can get into that a little bit a little bit later. But I want to just maybe ha ask you a little bit more about what what did happen and sort of historically what's going on in the '50s, '60s, and '70s, and then what changes in the '80s so that we reach this huge explosion of antidepressant use that you that you mentioned and um, we're talking about like primarily Prozac but also Paxil and Zoloft and the other drugs as well right? Yeah um, those are the other uh, SSRI antidepressants that are really at one point Prozac was the most prescribed um, or most used medication ever um, it, and you know just tremendous uh, rates of, of usage and profit um, so that um, arguably in the 1990s the SSRI antidepressants were the most profitable product and the most profitable industry in the world. Um, well historically you know psych drugs came about you know basically in the 50s was the first one Thorazine the antipsychotic uh, and lithium and then um, they were used pretty much for people with serious mental illness, you know, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. Um, Valium, which came out in the early 60s, was the first drug that made it okay to take a psychiatric drug if you weren't crazy, you know. This is mother's, mother's little helper, basically. 
Mother's Little Helper and Valley of the Dolls, Jacqueline Suzanne's book, and um, a bunch of celebrities talked about taking Valium. So Valium paved the way for Prozac. Um, it it made it okay to take it, you know, a psych drug if you weren't if you weren't mentally ill. Um, and so Valium became the most prescribed drug in the country at one point in the 70s. Uh, but then Valium was uh, had a, had addictive qualities um, for many people. And uh, so it's it sort of sunk very quickly in the in the 80s and um, had a stigma. So when Prozac came along in 1988, it seemed very clean and fresh compared to Valium. But again, the critical role of Valium sort of saying it's okay to take a, a, a psychiatric drug, you know, so you could be a judge or you could be a journalist and, you know, take take a psychiatric drug, which wasn't the case before. And, you know, largely speaking. And then um, the other critical factor leading to the, the, the huge use of the drugs was the TV ads. And what happened was there was a change in regulations in the 90s. Um, and it was, I think, a very simple technical thing. It basically said you, you um, could just refer to the side effects of the drug and not list them in entirety in your ad. And so if you notice when you listen to the... TV ads, they'll say CR ad in men's health, you know, and it was that technical change that made TV advertising possible. Before that, it was just print ads where you could list all the side effects, but with, a, with this change, you could do a TV ad and then just refer to, you know, and so New Zealand and the United States are the only countries in the world that allow the television advertising of drugs. And what that did is it brought them into prime time. They're heavily, heavily, heavily advertised, as we all know. Um, in the 90s, it was Claritin and the Purple Pill and then uh, Prozac and Paxil and Zoloft. A lot of those antidepressants have gone off patent and now, so they're, they're in generic form. The profit rates aren't the same from them. So now what you're seeing is a lot of the sleep aids on, on TV, like Roserum and Ambien and Lunesta. Um, and so this, the TV advertising had a, you know, absolutely profound effect on on the drugs. It it um, moved the attention towards the t the blockbuster drugs because that's the ones that they really pushed, the ones with more than a billion dollars in sales. And then I think it it made them seem like commodities, like you know, just the fact that they were advertised on, um, you know, next to Chevrolet or Diet Coke or toothpaste gave one the impression, you know, that they were just like those things, whereas I argue that drugs are drugs and they're powerful, you know, they can be extremely useful at times. Um, and I want to make very clear that I think the drugs can be incredibly useful for people with serious disorders, psychiatric disorders. Um, but, um, you know, they're not like, like toothpaste or Chevrolet, you know, they really are a separate entity. So that was a huge thing. And then the other historical factors um, was the, the emergence of managed care, which very much cast its lot with the drugs and making it easy for, you know, proof, approving drugs as opposed to psychotherapy or, or therapeutic approaches and, you know, really eroded the reimbursement rates for psychotherapists. And then the other historical factor is the emergence, the, the expansion of diagnosis that I referred to earlier. So um, with each successive edition of the DSM, there have been more and more diagnoses, and they basically, in my view, have been sort of watered down. So you'll see something like a you know, phase of life problem as a category in the DSM or an adjustment disorder. And so more and more, you know, psychiatry has gone from sort of the working with the people with really severe illness to, you know, more and more life problems and, and medicating things that are not necessarily mental illnesses, but more like life issues. Can you say, for people who don't know, can you just say a little bit about what the DSM is and also maybe mention that this, this trend to increase the number of diagnoses um, is, is, is continuing? And the, I guess the dsm four they're talking about like more than 400 diagnoses being in it. Is that right? The, the fifth ver version of the DSM is due out in 2012, and, and the speculation is it will include even more diagnoses than the last one, which has over 300. And that's very much been the trend since 1980 is just a huge expansion of diagnosis. If you look at the first edition of the, the diagnostic manual, uh, it's this thin little pamphlet. And, um, you know, the, the current DSM is like, a, looks like a Bible, you know. But basically what the DSM is, it's the 
it's published by the American Psychiatric Association, and it's um, a listing of the symptoms of um, different types of disorders. Uh, it's fairly accessible to read. Um, a lot of it makes a lot of sense. Um, a lot of it, I think, is very good. What I take issue with is how psychiatry has moved away from the more serious disorders to things that are you know, really, to me, more life issues. Um, so one of the diagnoses, for example, is called intermittent explosive disorder, um, which means you're really, really angry, <laughs> you know. And um, I worked with a client who had intermittent, who was diagnosed with intermittent explosive disorder. I kept on waiting for him to explode, and he never did. Um, but, you know, I, I would... I would argue that, you know, maybe in a small portion of people, they are so fiercely angry, angry that, you know, it merits clinical attention. But uh, to me, anger is not uh, a medical problem, you know, uh, except in a probably very small number, you know, percentage of people. And so what we've done is we've medicalized um, aspects of the human condition you know, anger or um, having difficulty with change, um, relationship problems. Um, and I think that's a, a huge error. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really interesting to, to talk with you because um, I think they would have been, it would have been impossible for us to really have this conversation like uh, uh, six years ago when the Freedom Center started because a lot of the, the things that you're saying now are really kind of starting to take a common sense kind of quality in the culture, whereas we were trying to argue about these points six years ago, and it was just like, forget it. What are you talking about? There's just much, much more resistance uh, to this. So it's really interesting um, to look at your, your book as part of a kind of historical moving away, the culture kind of moving away from the, the grip that it, it maybe had in the 90s in the biological perspective and the medicalizing perspective. Let me, let me ask you a question about um, depression. Um, do you think that the growing, the increase in antidepressant prescriptions, the skyrocketing of antidepressant depressant prescriptions, do you think that there's any part of that that's actually about an in increase in depression itself in society? Is there, because I, I had Bruce Levine on a few months ago, and he talked about uh, he made a very convincing case about how there's a community breakdown, there's an increase in stress in the economy. And so, yes, it's true that there's this marketing push, and yes, it's true that there's this complete inflation um, in the diagnoses. But all that aside, there also is a factor where more people are suffering in society to some, to some degree. Do you think that that's part of this as well? Yeah, I, I do. I, I, one of the chapters in my book is called American Misery. Um, and it's about um, exactly that, you know, isolation, technology, which can be wonderful, but can be terribly, you know, um, you know, disconnecting for people, connecting and disconnecting, um, you know, economic stress. Um, and I, I also write in the book about this irony that um, we've become much more aware of our moods um, and, a pre and there's been sort of this pressure to be happy, which is in, in the course of human history is an incredibly unusual phenomenon. I, I quote uh, Thomas Carlyle, uh, who wrote in 1815 um, that it's only been in the last couple of hundred years that anybody in you know, on, in the human race has even thought about being happy because everybody was running around, you know, trying to just to survive. And even in the American context, um, you know, Thomas Jefferson wrote about the pursuit of happiness, but what he meant was not um, individual follow your bliss happiness, but um, sort of a collective civic virtue of like we would his happiness was a societal thing that we would work together to create a, a great society. And really, so it's just been in the last maybe 30 years that this idea that you have to be happy and, and uh, you're, you're pressured to be happy, and, and, I, and I argue in the book that people feel entitled to be happy, has really happened. And I think the great irony is that it's actually led to more unhappiness because, um, you know, if you set out your goal to be happy, it, it often doesn't work. And, and I, I quote Robertson Davies, um, the late Canadian novelist, who says that happiness is a byproduct. And, and you know, if you become happy by um, uh, doing something you like, doing work you like, being with people you like, and you kind of turn around and you go, oh, I'm happy, you know. 
And so I would agree um, with Bruce Levine that, that there is in- increased stress, increased pressure, increased depression, but it's Again, it's of the. It's, it's not necessarily clinical major depression. Um, it is more um, of a sociological phenomenon and uh, can be redressed in other ways uh, rather than than the drugs as a, as the first line, which is what typically happens when you complain of those problems. It's going to a family doctor who now prescribes most antidepressants. Um, you know. They'll, they'll write the prescription, and I think there's other ways of, of, of approaching those problems. Tell us about um, the ways in which the, uh, the, clinical, the, the clinical trials and just the research around the usefulness and effectiveness of these, um, these antidepressants, how, how that, all that's been corrupted. And again, I mean, I, I agree with you. I have, I have plenty of friends, and I, I've talked with many, many people through my counseling and advocacy work uh, with the Freedom Center and with the Icarus Project who do find medication useful. So I, I, people who are, who are tuning in, um, we're talking with Charles Barber, who's the author of Comfortably Numb, How Psychiatry is Medicating a Nation. So we're not, this is not an anti-medication perspective by any means. And we definitely, you know, respect and, and understand that many people feel medications are helpful. But the, the point is that there's not really an honest story has, has really not been told about the medications. So, uh, Charles, tell us about the, the clinical trials aspect and the, the research corruption aspect. There was recently a, a story in the um, Public Library of, of Science that caused quite a stir about how a lot of the, um, the data have been really hidden from the public about how effective these drugs actually, actually have been shown to be. Yeah, what, um, there's been other research um, looking at the FDA trials um, of, of the drugs. Um, and, and one guy in Washington State uh, called Arif Khan used the Freedom of Information Act to access the FDA data, the full complement of data, as opposed to you know, what is selectively published in, in, uh, in uh, psychiatric journals, and um, found that the antidepressants effectiveness was not uh, hugely different than placebo. As, as I remember, um, his figures are something like 46% of the time the antidepressants were uh, effective and the placebo rates were something like 35%. Um, and so that's not a you know huge dramatic difference. And when I was working, uh, you know, with uh, people with mental illness in the in the 90s, the more the figures that you would more hear of the effectiveness of the of antidepressants were sort of 70 percent, you know, as opposed to these numbers that have been coming out lately of kind of 45 percent. And so, um, and and certainly the drug companies have um, you know highlighted the data that that makes them look good and 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 all that. Um, the other context of this is that there have been two so-called real-world studies, um, uh, as opposed to a sort of controlled clinical trial, the actual utilization of the drugs in, for real you know, people in real-life circumstances uh, for thousands of people. So the National Institute of Mental Health has released a couple studies in the last few years, one for antidepressants, one for antipsychotics, and, and um, you know, huge, huge number of people that they, they looked at. And again, the, the results were, were sobering for the antidepressants that they worked um, for, again, those sorts of numbers, you know, half the people or, or less. I, as I remember, I think they worked really, really well for about a third of folks and about 10 to 15 percent more they helped. And then the rest of the people, they did, they did nothing. Um, in the first trial of the medications. And, um, and as far as the antipsychotics, what they found was most of patients just simply stopped taking the drugs. The, I think the, the trial was 18 months, and um, the vast majority of, of patients just simply had stopped taking the drugs, which sort of makes you think, you know, maybe the drugs didn't work out so well, and, and probably related to the side effects of the drugs, which can be quite formidable with antipsychotics. Um, so th- to, to some degree, the other shoe has dropped on, um, on the drugs in, in recent years, and particularly in the last couple years, and the kind of high-flying hopes that we had for, for these drugs. Uh, I was working with people with schizophrenia uh, when these anti, new generation antipsychotics came out in like 94, 93, 95, and we thought they were going to be incredible. 
and the research shows that they're really not much more different than than you know older drugs, and the side effects are can be huge. So you know, there's been a sobering, a light of day uh, look that you know they're not wonder drugs, and they don't work for a lot of people. And as you say, um, we have that dialogue now that you couldn't have had you know, six or seven years ago. And I think people are kind of waking up to that reality. And I think also there's a there's a lot of research out there and folks who listen to um, the show and who are in, in touch with the Freedom Center, there's just a lot of research that when you when you dig deeper, even the percentage of, of um, greater effectiveness that some studies show, that starts to get whittled away. And there was a big story that was in the media, it was in The Guardian, uh, which is a big um, daily newspaper in um in uh, England, where it just said, "It's a great, it's a great paper, by the way. If, I'll put in a plug for the Guardian. It's really a terrific newspaper. If you want, if you want an alternative to, uh, yeah, it's, it's also just very well done and thoughtful. It's a great newspaper. Yeah, and they they were just saying that if you look at some of the studies that haven't been included in um, the the data that was um, made public, that actually the the effectiveness over um, anti uh, over placebo, which is basically a sugar pill that's used as a control in an experiment, really starts to look like it's not very much at all. And I think that there's a huge story here about just the power of of the mind and placebo and what we believe. And there was a story that I, I saw: are antidepressants faith based medicine because of the the mental factor, the placebo effect that is just so powerful and is, in, from a scientific perspective, they try and factor it out. A guy who studied the placebo effect um, found, for, for psychiatric drugs, found that the placebo effect has, had gone up, um, like in the last 15 years. In other words, it was, you know, we've been talking about it's kind of like 35%, you know, it, it was, you know, 20% effectiveness. So people thinking that the drugs would work and, uh, and the immersion in the drugs, um, my interpretation is that, you know, people thought they were even better and, it, and, and even the placebo effect, you know, went up over time. It's really interesting when you look at, like, the, the advertising because the advertising could definitely play a role in the placebo effect having more effectiveness. Um, let me ask you about, there's something that you mentioned in your, in your book, which I think is really interesting because it illustrates... Um, a lot of the the phenomena that we're talking about. Talk about um, antidepressant marketing in Japan, which is a really interesting story. Yeah, there there wasn't um, these antidepressants, the the SSRI antidepressants in Japan until the late 90s, and and part of the reason for that is that the drug companies just didn't think there was a market for it. Um, there wasn't even really much of a term for depression in Japan. Um, and de depression was considered, to the degree that there was a concept of depression, depression was considered not necessarily a bad thing, that it was maybe, you know, to feel sad was a sign of sensitivity or artistic sensibility. So the uh, drug companies invented a, a phrase um, called um, cold of the soul, uh, and did a very successful marketing campaign with a lot of um, quote unquote public education, uh, a lot of direct uh, contact with um, with doctors, and very rapidly uh, the 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 rates of the drugs went up um, dramatically. Um, I think you know. Five times over, you know, five times over in a two or three year period, um, and so it just goes. To, and then one of the executives was asked, "Well, why did you think you could do it? Because people thought, you know, Japan was not a market." And he said, "Well, we did it elsewhere, so we, you know, we thought we could do it here." Um, and so, you know, the the impact of the advertising and and how these things are framed and um, how the narrative is is placed is huge. Let's talk about, because um, we had mentioned um, the serotonin um, aspect of this before, and that I think was part of the marketing of the drugs was this really widespread belief. And again, six years ago, people would just walk out of the room, literally, when they just the walls would just come down when you would try and say that, well, like mental illness is not caused by a chemical ba imbalance, that the the message that we're getting about, okay, the drugs correct the chemical imbalance. The chemical imbalance is responsible for um, depression. People, in fact, I actually recently read a, a letter to the editor in, the, in Oregonian. I'm in Portland, Oregon, 
right now where someone was writing about my, my medication, my antidepressant medication is helping me, it's really wonderful, which is great. They've found something that's helpful for them. But she was saying, I have a serotonin deficiency and the drugs are correcting my serotonin deficiency. It's obviously something that her doctor told her or her or she learned on TV or something. Or she, or she saw from a, uh, interpreted from a drug ad. Or from a drug ad, absolutely. So then that really, I mean, we've been arguing about this for years and years and years, and now it's starting, the, the mainstream media is really starting to catch on to this idea that, hey, wait a second, this actually is not solid science, this idea of a serotonin deficiency or a chemical imbalance. And so can you talk about that and then maybe talk about, well, how do the drugs actually work for some people if they do? Because we've talked about placebo, but there actually is, you know, a chemical action that's taking place with these drugs. You know, I am not um, a scientist, but I spent tons of time, you know, reading neuroscience, talking to neuroscientists um, and, and writing about it. And I, and I guess pretty well because I showed my work and, you know, to them and got it right I, from what they said. So, um, there, there hasn't been a relationship between serotonin and depression proved. And so it's very, very simplistic um, to say there's a one-to-one -one relationship. Probably serotonin has something to do with depression, um, but how that is, what, what's going on, it's really unclear. Uh, just to kind of try and put it into some context, um, in talking to neuroscientists, the chemical changes introduced by um, Prozac, for example, um, happen really quite quickly um, on the brain. Um, but it takes typically three to four weeks for the drugs to take effect um, when they are effective. So, you know, the question was, why is there this lag time? And basically nobody had any idea. Um, one of the researchers I talked to um, has shown that the antidepressants um, can grow brain cells in the uh, hippocampus. Um, and by the way, it was considered dogma in neuroscience not all that long ago that the adult brain could not grow new brain cells, So this, it, which has been completely discredited. Um, and so um, the thinking, his theory is, and, and there's a lot of plausibility to it, um, is that the antidepressants are working because they create these new brain cells and in the hippocampus, which is heavily associated with mood and memory, um, and it creates it takes that long that long a time, like a month, to create a critical mass of these new brain cells that have a therapeutic effect. So, like, oh, you know this whole thing that we didn't even think was possible of growing brain cells, you know, oh, maybe that's how they actually work is, you know, so when I started talking to scientists, I was just really struck by how uh, unclear this territory is. Um, and that this, the notion that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between any neurotransmitter and any illness is just, you know, nonsense at this point. Um, another really striking conversation I had with a very eminent neuroscientist was, um, as you know, Will, um, most of the psychiatric drugs deal with like one of four neurotransmitters, like serotonin and dopamine are the best known. There's probably a hundred neurotransmitters. So I asked uh, this guy, this retired uh, neuroscientist, you know, how come it's just these four when there's like potentially a hundred out there? You know, is it is it because those four, like dopamine and serotonin, are most associated with mood and thought? problems. And he said, no, 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 it's just because the first drugs were found basically by accident in the 50s. In the 60s, they traced them to these particular neurotransmitters. And then basically all drugs since then have followed in that paradigm of, of copycat drugs for the most part. And so potentially there's another, you know, 80 neurotransmitters out there that could have just as an, you know, important impact. Um, and we just haven't gotten there yet. So we're, it's incredibly crude and premature, you know, what we're involved with. And, and I found that the more eminent scientists that I spoke to, and I spoke to the Nobel Prize winners, um, the more they said, we don't really know what's going on here, you know. So I agree with you, these cartoonish, simplistic explanations that are very appealing to people because you want something, you know, mental illness is very, very complicated and you want something simple and you want to blame it on something and you want to say it's because of this that doesn't have anything to do with me. Um, and so that's a message that's been very appealing both to the drug companies and to some 
you know, patient groups um, is to me is incredibly uh, simplistic. Well, I think it's really it's a really important point that you you make because um, you know, you have to look at this in a historical context because and also just in in a in a personal context for a lot of people like someone who is say not eating who is not and I've been in these situations not eating not getting out not leaving my room not getting out of bed not motivated not able to do things it's it's a life problem it's a mystery you don't know exactly what's going on is there a conflict with at work is there something has there been a breakup is it a poverty issue is there a malnutrition issue in the background what's going on here and then here comes this marketing message that says oh you've got a mental illness you don't have to blame yourself you don't you don't have to see yourself as lazy you don't have to see yourself as the cause of the problem because we're going to put the cause of the problem somewhere else and it's put in a place that is avoids all kinds of social political economic questions because it's put in the realm of science and biology this kind of thing so it's very very it's very appealing and i think a lot of the um there was a big push with psychoanalysis and psychotherapy and then family therapy to say oh you know these are problems that come from the family and the mom right. is mom is causing the problem and there's a right. schizophrenogenic well, schizophrenia was blamed on poor mothering at one point from my experience i and just personally and also working with people there's and this is actually a point of view that's coming back in the research that trauma including child abuse can play a role in experiences they get that get called schizophrenia or get called bipolar later on but again it's it's just this idea this very appealing idea of having a black and white simplistic as you said cartoonish explanation for for these complicated problems that are very individual and need to be looked at from the perspective of the of the individual let me ask you about um, the development of the understanding of the brain you, you mentioned about the idea that the brain can grow new cells is, is a new concept that was dogma just recently there's like no it can't happen but tell us about we were talking about this a little bit before the interview about how that idea of like well is is the brain a fixed biological thing or is it more of a responsive um, entity that that actually can be shaped and changed by experience and learning. Tell us about some of your research about that. Yeah, you know, it's called brain plasticity. That the that the brain is a far more plastic, changeable uh, organ than was far far more than was considered. You know, even recently, and it it, it changes in response to social cues and in um and, and social environment. So to give you an example. Um, a very influential study was done in the early 90s at UCLA, and it was for people with obsessive compulsive disorder. And they were given uh, two forms of treatment. One was um, uh, antidepressants, which can be very effective for, for OCD. And uh, the other um, was cognitive behavioral therapy, which also can be very effective for OCD, which is purely a, a you know talking to a therapist and looking at uh, how you the the thoughts and ideas but behind particular behavior and and learning how to do things differently and doing certain exercises and learning skills and relaxation exercises and stuff so they found that when the treatments were effective um, they did brain scans and they found that the um, a particular part of the brain called the right caudate nucleus which has been associated with OCD they found that both the um, Prozac and the CBT had a similar impact on reducing the activity of that particular part of the brain that's associated with OCD. And again, it was either one or the other. People were either getting Prozac or they were getting OCD. Uh, I'm sorry, they were getting um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. So there's been an increasing evidence, especially as the brain imaging has increased, has gotten better, um, that um, psychotherapy can result in detectable changes in the brain and structural and functional and so this idea that um, you know as, as we embrace the drugs and the neuroscience and the high-tech ways of looking at these things psychotherapy was kind of dismissed as soft and mushy-headed and you know silly and non-scientific um, Meanwhile, at, at, this, at the time as, as the drugs have, have been around, psychotherapy, many forms of it, um, have, have improved greatly and become very practical and, and goal-oriented and very, very effective and a whole range of treatments. And so the science, uh, the great irony is that the science is showing that when it's effective, therapy is, you know, can almost be construed as a biological treatment, that it changes the brain. 
Um, and our social experience changes the brain. Uh, so it's a paradigm shift that is not yet really uh, fully perceived or understood, although, like you say, there's a, a shift going on right now where uh, the other shoe is dropping on these very simplistic you know, strictly biological ways of looking at things, and we're starting to look at alternatives. We're starting to look at, you know, that the drugs aren't the be-all and end-all. And again, and and this message that that nurture is biological uh, is is to me a profoundly uh, important message. Um, you know, this idea that we're sort of hardwired for certain things or we're destined by our genes, you know, is really what, what the science shows is that a particular part of genetic expression is impacted by our, by our environment. So, um, again, we're way too quick to embrace these simplistic ways of looking at things. Right. So it's the idea that you, you start with a broken brain or, or faulty genes and then that causes your experience, well, actually it works, it may work in both directions, that your experience might be changing your brain. There's, like you say, evidence that ge genes actually can be turned on and turned off by environmental, by learning, by social things that, that happen to you. So this, this idea, it's, it's not so much that we're swinging, we've gone from nature to nurture, and then we're sort of swinging back from nature to nurture on the side of what is it biology or is it your environment it's more like the whole concept of what's a biological cause is changing itself it's it's being shown to be much much more complicated and that biology can actually be shaped by our experiences shaped by therapy shaped of course by drugs and medication that we take so it's a very dramatic kind of shift that we're undergoing right and and um you know i think that the wise People in psychiatry, mental health, um, sociology, because you know th this relates to uh, purely social ways of looking at things, are starting to see that nature and nurture, genes and environment, um, neuroscience and psychotherapy, you know, all these oppositions. Like psychiatry has been defined by these oppositions. It's one or the other. Um, I quote this very wonderful psychiatrist called Glenn Gabbard, who's at Baylor in Texas, saying, you know, psychiatry has always been a house divided against itself. And the smart people are starting to understand that it's not a matter of opposition. It's a matter of a dialogue between these two things. And there's a merger between these two ways of, of looking at things. So there's a new field uh, of social neuroscience, looking at how social roles and social cues change our brains and uh, to me that stuff is is terrific you know I, I talked to one of the leading um, researchers on depression uh, biological researchers and and he said that um, dep that the depression is about 50 percent genetic well that means it's 50 percent environmental you know and what happens in your life what happens in your relationships what happens in your um, you know what how, how you how you run your life you know is critical to your mood and and we've very quickly you know as you say in the 90s these terms like chemical imbalance and hardwired so i was running facilities for people with um schizophrenia primarily uh at that time and you know sort of started starting about sort of 1995 people would say you know i can't do the dishes tonight i've, I've got a chemical imbalance you know <laughs> which the, you know, I'm sure they do have a chemical imbalance, but there's also a whole other aspect of the story. Yeah, people have been just gotten that message, and then it becomes a, a, a way in which they create an identity around themselves. And, of course, we can go a lot further with this. As I, I had Gary Greenberg on the show um, a few months ago, and he, he wrote a, a piece about how he was a... Um, uh, he was a, he was somebody who talked a lot about Prozac and placebo and depression and and he um, talked about how he was actually a subject in one of these studies and he found it very interesting about how even pinning down like are you depressed or are you not depressed or do you fit this clinical category or do you fit that clinical category starts to get become very very fuzzy and questionable and and, and gray, and there isn't a kind of a, there's a scientific quality, maybe you and I will disagree on this, but there's a scientific quality that's really missing when you're trying to talk about human experience. Like, you can't really reduce things down to numbers and laboratory experiments because it's about human experience, which I guess brings us to, we haven't got a lot of time left in the, um, 
in the interview, but I wanted to ask you, because I think it's great that you've been writing about the recovery movement um, in the mainstream media, and I know that your book talks quite a bit about alternatives and why it is that these alternatives, which are you know, safer, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy doesn't have the side effects or dangers that Pro Prozac does, why is it that these um, alternatives haven't been promoted? And, and do you think that alternative approaches are going to start getting some validity and um, traction and support in, in the mainstream culture? Yeah, well, I think there's a very exciting movement, which is the, you know, the consumer movement in, in mental health, which uh, has really starting to be heard uh, by, uh, arguably, by mainstream, parts of mainstream psychiatry. And um, I think things like the internet um, and um, shows like yours and uh, so on, you know, really facilitate a dialogue. Um, and I think these voices are starting to be heard big time, um, e even in academic or traditional psychiatry. And, I, and people are telling their stories of recovery, um, and they're telling the, the establishment, you know, that things are much different than the way you told us they were going to be. So a particular example is, is how you get better. And, you know, to look at the drug ads, you know, it's a matter of 30 seconds. Um, you know, you're agonized and suicidal one moment, and then 30 seconds later, you're, you know, you take the drug, and 30 seconds later, you, you know, you're got your golden retriever at your feet, and your grandchildren at your knee, and you're back on the job and happy, and everything's copacetic. And you know, to to talk to people with with mental illness that have gotten better, they talk about uh, it's a decades-long process of recovery. And not only that, acceptance of the illness and, and, and learning how to live a meaningful life with the illness is a critical part of recovery. So there's not, you know, these ideas of cure or these things being just removed quickly are, are silly. And so recovery often involves learning to live a meaningful life, and, and often it's a new kind of life than you had before in the presence of ongoing symptoms. Hopefully those symptoms are getting reduced, but um, they are still present. And it's often how you live with those symptoms and understand those symptoms and sometimes find meaning in those symptoms, or, or, or I should say quite often how sometimes you find meaning. So I think that's a very, very profound message. And... Um, it's true, you know, it's based on lived experience. And so I'm very happy that with this book, uh, which there's a, there's a chapter called The Human Factor, uh, half of which is about the recovery movement and these kind of, kinds of lessons, that I, I believe it's among the first mainstream coverage of, of these issues. And I've been pretty heavily covered by uh, bloggers in, in the recovery movement. Um, and so I, just the fact that my book has gotten some attention and these alternative uh, approaches are, are, are being looked at, um, I think it's very, very exciting. And it's actually the, probably the part of the book that I'm most excited about. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I would have to agree with you. I think there's a, just so much change that's happening. I mean, there are other areas of society that I think are going kind of backwards in some way. There's the whole forced drugging and forced treatment debate that's being driven by stereotypes of violence and, and these kinds of things. And that's kind of moving backwards in some ways. But there, a lot of the criticism of the marketing and the overdiagnosis and this kind of thing is, is really starting to grow in the, in the culture. And it's really interesting that you mentioned um, that you, you've sort of been responsible for some of the first um, coverage of the recovery movement in, in a in a big in a big way that's made a big splash which is just really um, exciting I mean as someone we've been talking about this for for years and just I mean for me what's exciting and it's significant about the recovery movement is the emphasis on on diversity and so you say that s some folks are going to identify themselves as having an illness and that if that's effective and helpful if someone wants to say well my alcoholism is a disease or or I, I'm mentally ill and that's useful for them that's something I, I support based on their choice. But a lot of us have really found that defining ourselves as ill is actually part of the thing that keeps us <laughs> keeps us ill. And, and whereas I would absolutely agree that part of what I've done, because I was diagnosed with schizophrenia, and part of what um, I had to do is to really start to say, well, okay, well, I'm going to have times when I feel very withdrawn and I don't want to be out in the world and I'm struggling with stuff in my in my head and voices and, and to really define this as having meaning and being part of my own creativity and being part of my own 
Um, and, and maybe maybe that's something that's going to change. Maybe it'll take decades. Maybe it won't. Maybe this is something that's just I, the poet Rilke said. I wouldn't want you to take away my my demons because that would also take away my angels. So there's a there's an aspect of just respecting individuality that's really important here. But I think it's also important to mention that sometimes I mean I've talked to people who go into the hospital as a teenager, get a diagnosis of bipolar, told that they have to be on medication for the rest of their lives, get out of the hospital, stop taking the medication, just ignore the diagnosis, and then they're fine. I mean, there are people like that out there. Oh, absolutely. So I think the important piece is to recognize the diversity that's going on and to really kind of take away these messages that the pharmaceutical companies and the doctors are giving us, which aren't actually accurate, so that people can explore for themselves and find for themselves. So the the other point of that is what you refer to is is treatment works best when the recipient of the care is really directing the treatment and is in charge of the treatment and not looking at doctors and therapists as you know bosses, but as sort of an expert consultant. And the the Home Depot message, um, uh, you can do it, we can help, is is really what I think a lot of consumers are saying. And, um, you know, you rely on other resources, but it really, it's this, finding meaning, uh, finding your resources, finding your strengths. That's another huge change in mental health is being strength-based rather than deficit-based uh, and symptom-based. Um, that you're that I've worked a lot in social service agencies and there's been a total change from what's wrong with you to what's right with you when you start to work with people. So uh, there a lot is going on right now. Yeah, that's great. So tell us um about more about your book and your I know you have a website so people can get in touch with you if they want to and yeah, uh, it's called uh, Comfortably Numb, How Psychiatry is Medicating a Nation. It was published in uh, February by Pantheon. Um, and uh, the website is charlesbarberwriting.com, and Barber is B-A-R-B-E-R. Uh, there's a way to uh, contact me. Um, I've been uh, doing a lot of speaking uh, engagements, um, particularly interested in, in talking to consumer groups. Um, I tend to be very good with responding to email. Um, I'm a little overwhelmed at the moment, but I will get back to you. So uh, I, that's the way to contact me. And, and, and you know, there's, there's really been going a lot, a lot going on. So it's been exciting and a little stressful. Well, great. Well, thanks a lot, Charles Barber, for joining us today on Madness Radio. Thanks so much, Will. Very good questions. I, I, I thought this was a terrific interview. Uh, so you've been listening to an interview with Charles Barber. Charles is the author of Comfortably Numb, How Psychiatry is Medicating a Nation. That's about all the time we have this week on Madness Radio. Thanks a lot for tuning in. You've been listening to Madness Radio, voices and visions from outside mental health. Madness Radio is broadcast every Wednesday, 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Pacifica Affiliate, WXOJLPFM 103.3 Valley Free Radio in Northampton, Massachusetts. For our live internet stream, podcasting, show archives, and more, visit madnessradio.net. Madness Radio is co-produced by Freedom Center and The Icarus Project. For more information, check out freedom-center.org and theicarusproject.net. For more mental health radio, listen to the news hour from mindfreedom.org, Wednesdays, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have an idea for a story or guest on Madness Radio, or you just want to share what's in your head, contact us at radio at madnessradio.net. KWMD Kasilov. 90.7, Anchorage 104.5.